at the large densely populated hill fort of Tapanos in Aberdeenshire, uh, which is located about three hours drive to the north of us. And uh, I want to specifically talk about how that uh, investigation is starting to unravel uh, a potential new horizon for urban-like settlement at the northwestern edge of the Roman Empire. So, um, this project really was part of the comparative labor Hume funded comparative kingship project, which is looking at the development of early medieval kingdoms of Northern Britain and Ireland. And um, some of you might wonder why we're digging Tapanos, because Tapanos um, is often suggested to be a Bronze Age hill fort. So um, to contextualize the importance of the potential discovery of a, of a, of a new horizon of hill fort settlement, um, Large-scale population centres are not thought to have existed in northern Britain until the end of the first millennium AD, with all of the hill forts in the region tending to date to around 400 to 200 BC. Um, with the very big hill forts like Tapanoth, always assumed to represent late Bronze Age um, hill forts, their dense internal settlements representing uh, continued use and activity over the course of several centuries. Now, that interpretation was not always the case. Back in the 50s and 60s, researchers like Dick Feacham had argued that these big, large, intensively occupied hill forts were in fact part of the final phase of hill fort horizons in Northern Britain, representing um, occupation and construction of hill forts around the end of the uh, first millennium BC, so um, just before the Roman invasion. Um, so that's where that's where we're starting with our with our Tapanoth um, excavations. So Tapanoth actually is part of this uh, expansive early medieval landscape, which uh, Gordon has been excavating for the past ten years, particularly the the central enclosure here in the landscape Barflat, which has been dated to around the fifth sixth century A.D. Uh, and then more recently, we've been excavated at Cairn Moor, another small hill fort, uh, again a contemporary site, 5th, 6th century AD. And then surrounding the Bar Flat enclosure complex, we have uh, again another contemporary 5th, 6th century AD symmetry complex. And that's again associated with um, early medieval sculpture, an incredible assemblage of early medieval sculpture. So, um, as part of trying to contextualize this landscape, this 5th, 6th century AD landscape, we spent three seasons initially uh, looking at Tapanoth. So Tapanoth comprises two principal elements. We have the inner enclosure there, which is um, a vitrified oblong fort, typically dated to around 400, 200 BC. And then we have the outer enclosure, which is a much larger 16.5 hectare dumped stone rampart. And that surrounds around 200 house platforms as identified by Ian Ralston in the 1980s. So um, we spent two seasons excavating within the interior of the Oblong Fort, uh, and this was principally to target two U-shaped banks, which were suggested to represent later activity. And we thought potentially that could relate to the extensive 5th, 6th century AD activity in the local landscape. So we excavated some relatively large trenches in the interior, as well as some trenches up against the bank to try and characterize and date those U-shaped banks activity in the interior, as well as get some dating information for the Oblong Fort. So we found um, these U-shaped banks actually represented uh, the footings for two wooden palisades. We found some intact wall facing to the Oblong Fort, including some nice beam slots at the base. We found activity abutting um, the Oblong Fort, but very little activity in the interior, very little, if any, activity. And unfortunately for us, all the radiocarbon dates came back 400, 200 BC, so not 5th, 6th century AD like we wanted. In fact, if you look at that radiocarbon plot, it's the most comprehensive yet boring set of radiocarbon dates you could see. Um, the outliers are, are outlined by about 50 years. So what we're seeing here is that every single thing that's happening in the Oblong Fort, from its construction, its use, its destruction, and its reuse and reoccupation, is dating to this late Iron Age, uh, or sorry, Middle Iron Age phase. So we had one final season to tackle the outer fort, and 
obviously our heads were down. We didn't expect too much from that. We started off before our excavations commissioning a large scale LIDAR survey and this indicated the settlement within the interior was much more extensive than what Ian Ralston had identified. We increased the number of house platforms from 200 up to just over 800 examples. And these included a range of different sizes, a range of different shapes. We identified uh, a dozen or so um, trackways servicing these houses. And we also identified the layout of the structure of the settlement. So it, it seems that a lot of these platforms were uh, built in rows or in lines. But if we looked really closely at the LiDAR, we also see that some of these platforms are built on really long elongated terraces. Um, that stretch sometimes over 100 meters long, which suggests that there is uh, a planned layout to the site, but also a communal effort in building those house platforms. And once those elongated terraces are built, then individual households come along and they further augment where they're placing their individual house. So uh, planned layout and communal effort in excavation. So. We first tackled the uh, a trench across the uh, large outer fort. We found that it comprised uh, a stone rubble bank that actually held in place what was probably a very large timber palisade. And then we excavated two house platforms. Here's uh, one example. It revealed two sequential hearths as well as multiple floor layers. But very interestingly, it produced uh, that um, mold fragment. Now that mold fragment was very similar to some of the material that was coming out of the Barfat enclosure, 5th, 6th century AD Barfat enclosure in the immediate landscape. And then in the lower uh, occupation deposits, we found some imported pottery, possibly uh, late Roman amphora. And then we got all the way to carbon dates back for this. And we identified that the large enclosure and the two house platforms that we investigated actually dated to the late Roman Iron Age and pushing into the early medieval period. So around the third to sixth century AD in date. So now we have to question, you know, all of these house platforms, they don't seem to truncate one another. They're built in rows. Are these actually forming a large scale, broadly contemporary settlement? And if they are, is this now the largest native late Roman Iron Age early medieval fort in Northern Britain. Indeed, if we start to think about um, the depopulation of all of the Roman towns in Southern Britain at this time, potentially is this the largest settlement that we know of full stop in Britain at this time? That's a bit more speculative. But this pushed us on to do more excavation of the house platforms. And since we've started, we've dug another six house platforms or, or, or more, and we still have a few more to dig over the course of the next few years. And these additional excavations have really uh, reinforced the, um, our ideas of how these houses were built, um, but also given us a clue as to the material culture and the lives of the people occupying these sites. So it looks like these houses were built with turf walls. Some of them had internal support posts, probably from roofs. Um, very often they have uh, slightly off center hearths that are more pushed down towards the lower slopes of the, of the terrace. And the material culture started to produce some fantastic native pottery. Uh, and again, at this time period, we have very little indications of indigenous pottery beyond the Northern Isles in, in Scotland. So this is probably the, the best contextualized example of indigenous pottery from this time period in Northern Britain. And then in another house platform, uh, another two sets of house platforms, the upper platform here, I, we identified four sequential hearths built one on top of the other, and the lower hearth um, was actually associated with imported pottery, um, possibly from the southern part of England. So they're importing material to the site. Uh, we also had from this, uh, uh, from this platform some unworked glass, potentially glass working. Um, and then we have these incredible stone pallets. Um, prior to this, we only had found these in contemporary burial contents in Northern Realms. So uh, another two platforms, we excavated more hearths, more indigenous pottery, but also this incredible painted pebble. Um, and this is a, a crescent shape, which is uh, one of these Pictish symbols. And this was potentially used in the, the leather working, uh, in leather working. 
And our more recent um, excavations in the summer, we excavated four house platforms um, as well as part of a trackway. Each one of these house platforms produced multi-phase hearths, uh, in, including one platform that had up to four hearths again. And again, we have some incredible material culture, including early medieval glass beads, some tiny glass beads, work stone objects, possible fragments of Roman glass um, and uh, bronze sheet. And for the first time at the site, we also have animal remains uh, and these are these are horse teeth. So this leads us into the question of, even though this is very clearly a significant place for the region inferred by the resources invested in its construction, the size and scale of the settlement um, and the exotica found on site, what, what, what's actually going on? What the hell is it? Is this an assembly site, an inauguration site? Is it a proto-urban town or village? And if we look at some of the contemporary parallels in other places, other parts of Europe, like Ireland, um, in Ireland, we have over 115 of these uh, Onyx sites, these assembly sites, um, including some incredibly well-preserved landscapes like uh, Rahina Madra Hill, one of the core focuses of Onyx Clutter, one of the preeminent assembly sites in Munster in Ireland. And we see, even though there are some incredible archaeological monuments, including large-scale enclosures, large tumuli, some weird curses-type passageways, um, there's nothing indicating any type of large-scale settlement like we have at Tapanoth. Um, and we see this in other parts of Europe. There's just assembly sites just don't have these large-scale settlements. So that brings us to the idea of, is Tapanoth a proto-urban center? Is it a small town, a village? And obviously there's been a variety of different checklists developed over the course of the past 70 years. And Tapanoth really fits well with some of this checklist criteria. But I think we should forget about all this, like some of the other earlier talks have suggested, scale in relation to what's happening in the local landscape is key here. And if we look at Neil Sharple's work at some of the developed hill forts in southern Britain, he argues that uh, the contrast between these sites and a normal farmstead must be seen as dramatic and enormous, and it warrants the consideration that these settlements are of a different order of significance. Uh, and same goes for Tapanoth, really. Um, even if we can't actually define Tapanoth as an urban site in terms of the criteria that it fulfills, it's certainly very, very different to anything we're seeing in the local landscape. So that brings us on to a new question. Regardless of if Tapanoth is an assembly site, is it a uh, proto-urban town or village? Um, are there any parallels for Tapanoth? And can these parallels give us any ideas uh, as to the, the function of the settlement itself? Unfortunately enough, there are some parallels. We have a, a great hill fort only an hour south of us, Eildon Hill North. Um, and even though there's some considerable late Bronze Age phases to this site, there's also quite a lot of late Roman Iron Age, early medieval material here. We have um, surface finds from the 2nd to 4th century AD, and we also have some possible Roman artifacts in the core of the bank material as excavated by Ali Owen in the 1980s, um, potentially suggesting reworking of the defences at that time. And then our most recent excavations at this site in April have also suggested that we can push that chronology further forward, where we have 5th, possibly 6th century AD activity at this site as well. And this is an incredibly important site because it overlooks um, the, the really important um, Roman fort of Newstead. Um, and we also have a Roman signal station right at the very summit of the site. So it brings in the whole idea of if this is uh, a late Roman Iron Age town or village, if it's in use at the same time as Newstead is being used, and if they're actually incorporating and letting the Romans build a signal station up here, what's going on? Is there some weird cooperation between the Romans and the natives happening? And then we go to another incredibly famous uh, hill fort in Northern Britain, uh, probably the most celebrated example uh, in the region, Traprain Law. And if we look at one of the most largest earthworks on the summit, a 12 hectare enclosure, that's been relatively dated to the, the 3rd to 5th century AD. And then Carl's excavations of the southwestern part of the summit, uh, he produced 1st to 5th century AD material culture, a, a huge assemblage of material culture from that time period, indicative of intensive occupation and potentially a large-scale settlement on the hill at that time. And then 
we can move to another incredibly famous hill fort, Burnswar Hill, a hill fort that's probably constructed in the early Iron Age and potentially reworked in later periods. Um, but uh, Joby's excavations in the interior identified intensive activity in the 1st and 2nd century AD. And then if we look at John Reed's recent work, um, which really solidifies the idea that this is a, a genuine Roman siege, then we start to think, would the Romans really put the effort, time, and resources into building these incredible siege works if there wasn't a large-scale native centre at this site at that time? And then we go to another incredibly famous site, the Evering Bell um, in uh, the Cheviots, overlooking the incredible Anglo-Saxon Hall complex. Um, one season of excavation here by Hope Taylor, unfortunately he lost the archive. Um, but from the little we know about the excavations, we have material culture dating to the 2nd to 4th century AD from these house platforms. So potentially suggesting, again, another large settlement dating to this uh, late Iron Age, pushing into the early medieval period. And then we can go to more exotic locations like Wales. And we have a variety of other large hill forts, densely populated full dry garn and the celebrated tree carry and lots of material culture from the latter that again dates to this uh, late Roman Iron Age phase. So a very tentative outline chronology, even if we just take the northern British examples, we see something is happening uh, around the late Roman Iron Age, early medieval period at these large densely populated hilltop sites. Now, either this represents a new horizon for large-scale native settlement in this period, still lots more work to be done, but it certainly is a, a tantalizing um, possibility. Thank you very much.